I want to thank LECNIC for inviting me. I hope that what we are going to discuss today may be uh, new to you. Actually, the satellite issue, I think that the, the time has come in history when it, 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 it was sort of uh, forgotten. The satellite issues uh, at a time was very relevant, but it, the, uh, uh, then the time came when it uh, slumbered down, and I think that it's becoming relevant again. Thanks to our friends, our SpaceX, like Elon Musk and the Amazon people with the huge Leo constellations, they brought the satellites again under the radar of all of us. Just as a brief introduction of our company, this is not a commercial issue. But we are part of the Utilsat group uh, based in France and recently uh, partly in the UK. We have 36 geostationary satellites and 634 low Earth orbit satellites. And this is very important because traditionally the geostationary <laughs> satellites are the ones that we've always known, 36,000 kilometers high, and they are rotating around the world at the same speed that the Earth does. So. Uh, we apparently they seem to be uh, 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 still not moving. That's why they are called stationary. They are so important for broadcast and ETH. Is uh, uh, um, the the antennas are uh, facing the sky, not moving, and uh, they can cover large extensions. So those are the geostationary satellites. However, now we have a new technology that uh, the low orbit satellites are at uh, from 800 to 1200 kilometers much closer to the Earth and those satellites cannot move at the same speed because they are too, too close. So the way they work is a bit different and that's what I'm going to show you. So we'll now be hearing a lot about multi-orbit connectivity. Multi-orbit connectivity states that even though you might think that low Earth orbit might replace the geo satellites, the situation is not exactly like that. Each has its own niche, each has its own functionality, and the new option will add on to what we already have, many applications that were working in GEO we no longer do so and will go over to LEOs. But this does not imply that geostationary satellites will be forgotten. And even at the organization, we are considering a new geostationary satellite for 2027. This is a FlexSat satellite and other satellite operators like GEOX recently launched the a third version of the satellite, so the traditional geo satellites will be continue to be part of the ecosystem. But we at One Web decided to buy low orbit constellation of One Web. This was created in 2019 in order to, as satellite operators, provide solutions in the two orbits. So as you can see on the slide. You have the GEO satellites at 36,000 kilometers and the LEO satellites with the different applications. Hey, what? So as I was saying, we are aiming at having the two systems, the geostationary system, which as I mentioned, are satellites that have pre-established geographic coverage. It can be regional that cover an entire continent, or even more specific areas that cover just the southern cone, or high throughput satellites that have very small beams and cover limited parts of a country and focus the entire capacity on specific points. This is supplemented by the low orbit layer, which provides us an ex extended scope, high throughputs, and low latency from what we will see in the next slide. 
So to give you more general information, as I was saying, we have a series of geostationary satellites all over the globe. They are positioned along the equator. And for the other uh, operators, all traditional operators of uh, geostationary satellites have the geo fleet on a fixed point over the equator. And for users, this is a point that doesn't move, so you can have a fixed terminal with no intelligence focused on that point in order to achieve connectivity. In the case of geo satellites, traditionally, what they used to do, what operators used to do, is to have a tele teleport on Earth to teleconnect with the satellites and provide service to the different users, whether broadband services or mobile phone services, business services, services to vessels or airplanes. So that was more or less the scheme. The operators set up the teleport, and these services are provided to the different customers through the geostationary satellite fleet. Later on, over time, operators decided to remove the capex burden from operators and as operators to set up the platforms and start to steal the services administered in MEPS. So this would be adding on to what I was saying of the low orbit layer. So now I will share you the architecture and design of a low orbit network. This is a typical one we have at OneWeb. We have the three different types of orbits. We have the geostationary orbit, which provides a latency of 650 milliseconds in average. Then we have the MEO orbit, which is between 5,000 and 12,000 kilometers height. The latency is 200 milliseconds. And then we have the LEO orbit, which is between 800 and 1,200 kilometers and gives a latency of 100 milliseconds depending on the location of the terminal. The latency issue for LEO orbits sounds very attractive, but not all applications are sensitive to latency. For example, for mobile phones, we're working on KU band and KA band for many years with uh, latency of 150 milliseconds, Sin embargo, hay otras... which is imperceptible for people who are speaking. But there are other that are more latency sensitive, like banking. And now that we are having the IoT and autonomous vehicles, the issue of latency of 150 milliseconds can be of key importance. A uh, further topic, which not, might not be that critical, is in the case of gaming. You know that a 600 milliseconds ping might imply that they killed you. So for gaming, for banking, for stock exchange, latency is very important. So that you can understand how the general architecture of the system works. We have here the device of one web that has been approved with everything that you have behind. So this would be the end user. And in the end, in the end we have what is provided by the operator. So an important thing is that as an one web, we don't reach the end customer, we have distribution partners because we focus on what we have in red here in the middle. Similar low orbit services such as Starlink, you can directly access the website and purchase the terminals and obtain the internet service. But we don't work like that. What we do is to make the distribution partners, the satellite constellation available, the one we have in the space, and this is delivered in a point of presence. This point of presence, the distribution partner includes internet or can also provide interconnection with a client's core or with a private network. So 
this constellation is therefore quite different because in, in the event of not having internet, in none of these points along the chain, you access internet. So banking applications for military applications, for a client that wishes to preserve their private network or for mobile networks that don't wish their traffic going through the internet, one web offers these constellations. So what we offer is that once the equipment is connected to the network, then communication between the equipments and the satellite constellation is done through the KU band and with the different dayways, it's done through KA band. Over here, we see the SMPs, which are the satellite network portals. These are stations, these are teleports located strategically around the globe to provide interconnection with the satellites. So this goes through the private MPLS network and then the specific points of presence. And in the case of distribution, this is done with the distribution partner. And if you wish to have internet, then it provides connection to the internet through the distribution partner. Um, so this, uh, can you click on play? So our constellation, the OneWeb constellation, has 634 individual satellites. As you see, this is a polar constellation. It goes from north to south and from south to north, depending on the path. So it has 12 planes, which have been divided through the different longitudes on Earth. Each of these has about 48 satellite per plane. Overall, 576 active satellites. The other satellites are back up and have the payload turned off so as not to waste power. Each plane is separated by four kilometers so that there is no interplane connection. And this is particularly important when they reach the ends of the Earth. As you can see in the animation, the closer to the poles, the satellites get closer, and when they go through the equator, they are more spaced out. So that is why the planes have been separated to avoid these collisions. The highest plane of these constellations is at 1,219 kilometers, and the lowest at 1,175 kilometers. The other constellations work in a similar way. This depends on the height. So depending on the height, you'll need to have more satellites to provide global coverage. Now, because we have a 1,200 kilometers height with the 634 satellites, we can provide global coverage. However, the SpaceX Starlink constellation is at a lower orbit at 800 meters, so they have about 5,000 or 6,000 satellites. So this is a minimum required to cover the entire globe. We could increase the number of satellites, but with these 12 planes and with 634 satellites, we have completed generation one. Later on, we have the next generation, the second generation, replacing and updating and increasing the number of satellites to cover a greater bandwidth with the constellation. Here you have an animation where you see the satellites, which are the white dots on the tr trip across the Earth from north to south. And we also have to bear in mind a further important aspect when designing the constellation. Compare it with GEO, which is a fixed point in space. In addition to having satellites moving, the Earth also rotates. So all this has to be taken into account when designing a low orbit constellation. Here we can see that each satellite travels at an approximate speed of 26,000 kilometers per hour. The red dots represent 
the teleports, the gateways, which are the ones that communicate with the satellites in order to become integrated to the network. The red lines are the communications from the gateways towards the satellite. This is in Ka band. And the white circles, which I will show you, those are representing communication between the sites and the satellites. As you can see, they follow a satellite until they stop seeing it, and then they go over to the next satellite. And if they rotate, it selects the one that goes into the next plane. So these are not satellites that are maintained on the same plane, but as the Earth rotates, they connect with that plane, but the plane will have shifted and then they take the next plane. So in the same day, one central site which is fixed, we'll be seeing many satellites from different planes. Each of these satellites is divided into 16 beams. Each beam of these satellites is active in about during about eight, 11 seconds, and then it goes on to the next beam. So after 2.3 minutes, it goes over to the next satellite. So this is a totally dynamic constellation. Each beam covers an area of 1,600 kilometers with times 65 kilometers height. Overall, the 16 beams together cover a total area of 1,600 kilometers at the same time. So here we can see how a terminal, although stationary, goes from one beam to another with the same satellite. And once the satellite escapes the visible area, it goes on to the next satellite. So here we can see how it hops from one satellite to another. And in addition to the Earth's rotation, it might hop to a satellite of the next plane. <laughs> so to tell you about the capacity, having so many satellites, we have the largest possible capacity you have compared to the geo technology. So it can deliver 480 Mbps, so eight satellite has an eight giga capacity. So now, just uh, to show you the terrestrial stations, the satellite network portals here, this may clarify the issue of the points of presence and the portals. What you see here on the map, the red uh, antennas are the SMPs the SNPs, the portals or gateways. These are the ones that are intercommunicating with the satellites to integrate them in uh, the uh, MPLS uh, network. Uh, and uh, uh, the number one uh, doesn't have uh, the, the satellites in the space uh, do not intercommunicate. So in order to be, get integrated to the one web uh, network, they need an associated get gateway. So, and that it's that is why it's important to differentiate them from the POPs, that the POPs, that are those small squares. For South America, we have one in Chile, we have uh, two POPs in Brazil, Fortaleza and Sao Paulo, and in Mexico, we have uh, one in Querétaro. And it is there that. Well, that uh, gives us the uh, capability f so that we it, they can uh, provide connectivity services. This here you have a couple of pictures of the way the gateways are seen. Here we have an SNP, Santiago de Cali in Colombia, and another one in Toluca, Mexico. So these are antennas that are tracking the satellites into different planes. These are constantly moving tracking all the satellites and when they finish the um, they it's 16 antennas for each gateway and they follow the different planes so that to make sure that they cover all the satellites that are uh, uh, hovering above the area so I hope that with Everything I mentioned that uh, the Earth is moving, the satellites are moving, etc. 
this you may this that may help you understand this slide what i'm showing here is for paraguay the gateways that provide service to it that is depending on where the satellite is going through it might get be uh, closer to um, uh, land uh, the gateway in Arica or Santiago, those are the red tri triangles, than the teleport of uh, uh, Petrolina or Marica. So it's not that the same point is uh, landing in the same gateway. At the end, we all concentrate that in just one point of presence. In the case of Paraguay, it's in Sao Paulo, and it is there that we collect all uh, the connectivity. But if, for instance, in this slide, an average for Paraguay, we have 10% of the time a station uh, in Paraguay would receive the gateway the, that would receive the connectivity would be in Santiago, which gives a 60 millisecond latency. 42% is landing in Brazil, which gives a latency, an average latency of uh, 16. And um, um, then uh, Marica and Petrolina. So you see that the average time is 121.8 milliseconds. That's the latency between the uh, user's terminal and uh, the point. And if there's an additional private network from the teleport of Sao Paulo to the clients, well, the, the, you need to add the latency. But this, what corresponds to the satellite is 121 milliseconds. Now. Uh, we prepared more well, for Asuncion. We have the same situation, but uh, with a uh, uh, smaller latency. It's a bit uh, under the average. Here, we you would only it, uh, Asuncion will only treat with Santiago, Marica, and Arica, and the average latency would would be 96.41 milliseconds. Now, as to coverage. This is the coverage that we have at present with a, a teleport of Kali that was deployed early this year. We already have full coverage in South America. The only little piece that you see there that has no coverage is that tip in Brazil. And once we have an additional gateway that's about to be deployed, then uh, that would uh, provide full coverage. And this is the coverage that is planned for uh, first two quarters of 2025. And you see the um, uh, coverage. Well, these are political issues. But from one our side, uh, coverage would be 100%. So in terms of global coverage, satellite level, well, the issue is has more to do with the uh, installation of the, the uh, gateways and legal and regulatory issues. As we see in other constellations, for instance, Starlink is very similar. They have global coverage, but because of regulatory issues, they don't have, uh, um, uh, can't provide services in other countries. And here in Paraguay, uh, they entered uh, two months ago. So we are starting to hear about Starlink and the uh, uh, low orbit technology. So I, I also wanted to tell you about the different um, uh, user terminals. We have agreements with a number of vendors, depending on uh, the uh, application. And with these terminals, every, these are dual down uh, terminals, similar to what you may see in ships, pontons and cruise ships. And because these are antennas that have satellite tracking technology. And these are the ones that we work with when the apps require a high throughput and high availability, because these are antennas that are 70 centimeters each. And we have an option of 130 centimeters where they have a great uh, gain and great performance. And for high throughput uh, uh, performance, that's significant. However, we also have uh, a number of partners that have have developed flat panel antennas. They are smaller, not those huge antennas that uh, of the dual dome. We have 
the whole issue of uh, chimera and hues in Tellian. They have developed different uh, antennas that are compatible with our constellation, and they are much faster to deploy, maybe uh, sacrificing some, uh, through some part of the throughput. And we also have an option of military terminals military type with that meet all the military standards for rapid deployment on the field this is just to show you that at least our constellation is not just one single terminal for all but we focused for instance on whether it's land fixed or mobility or if it's a, a backhole or a military issue so for each of these there's a different type. So now let's go to the uh, use cases and uh, successful cases. Geo Panama has disappeared even after the uh, uh, inclusion of uh, the low orbit, uh, um, we uh, like one web. Uh, we continue to give geostationary service orbit services. Here we have with our uh, partner at Telefonica Global Solutions. We are giving connectivity to over a hundred stations for uh, back cell uh, backhaul for 3G, 4G stations, uh, base stations connected in the most remote areas in Peru. Not do we have a, a privilege of being flat in all the countries as you do. So you know that we, we, we have mountain ranges and different heights. So the satellite issue is always an option. And this is one of the examples that Leo does not replace. Certainly some of these stations will be uh, complementary with a Geo and a Leo antenna, but uh, so far this is the solution that has been implemented and it's going to remain like this for the next two to three years. Another relevant project is Internet for All in Mexico for the with the Federal Commission for Electricity that was uh, entrusted providing uh, connectivity to uh, schools and healthcare centers. In the next slide, we uh, discuss it a bit further, but it's about three f or four thousand sites that uh, were that received a system with uh, Utilsat E65 West A in a stationary. Um, uh, service and this is an example where Starlink replaced it uh, absolutely because the president, because uh, AMLO asked Starlink to, so that all the schools could receive Starlink connectivity, and in the mining part with a partner, INET Communications in Guyana. Um, the mining uh, systems uh, have small antennas and uh, traditional routings with uh, plans of 10 megas and 3 gigabytes capacity. So these are some of the examples mm, designed for social inclusion, but we would we would have also, well, they, we have such cases in Colombia and also the projects of connectivity in Peru in Chile, uh, schools, and the geo uh, issue continues to be relevant, but LEO will be a significant complementation for all of this. Um, this is the CFE telecom project providing connectivity to over 5,600 sites with 3.3 Gbps connectivity, and the satellite is a high throughput uh, a satellite with concentrated beams where each of these beams may have until oh up to one gbps uh, so and the antennas are small and may have a um this is a, a significant alternative against leo So the complement of uh, the constellation, and usually the uh, low constellations, 
basically here put it in four but we could continue but this is for uh cellular backhole enterprise mining and uh, trains in the cell backhole it's very important because our leo network is an extension may become an additional uh, network uh, of uh, so we we can connect directly to the core without uh, without having to go through the internet so this is very important obviously as i said uh, cellular uh, mobile um, connectivity helps you reach uh, places where with other technologies it would be much more expensive and we've tested and we have 3g 4g and 5g technology enterprise there was also uh, access to a private uh, mpls and network and uh, it's uh, absolutely private with it not going through the internet and then in mining uh, it uh, ensures quality of life with high velocity high speed internet and uh, um, it can be used uh, for uh, mails and streaming and surfing the network uh, the way the latency is not so critical but using the leo part for autonomous vehicles data centers uh, telemedicine so because this is something that may be very latency sensitive and for the train system now we could have a, a combination where um, and the trains you would have the wi-fi for passengers and also uh, controlling management and then the infrastructure the uh, signals and and so that the maintenance teams could uh, send their reports of uh, the state of operations and finally the remote stations to do uh, and and then uh, the Wi-Fi so that it can be shared uh, in the st at the station. I don't want to discuss the technical details, but this is one of the case studies that we presented. It's uh, for the Polsat, uh, um, where basically uh, here we are showing the different slides. We have a remote site with a dual DAMA terminal that gets connected to our one web terminal, providing connectivity to the, uh, in the SMP. It interconnects with the SMP, with the London Gateway, and it's in London that we have the POP, and it interconnects uh, with uh, uh, the one in Frankfurt, and they take it to Warsaw to uh, the headquarters of uh, Ponsat to, to integrate it. And uh, there have been throughput and streaming tests, uh, etc. And uh, everything has been seamless. Uh, and uh, everything was done with Nokia and uh, Ericsson 2G and uh, 4G, even with the best effort uh, plan. And uh, the tests were successful. For the cellular backhaul, the options are diverse. We can use one of these antennae, uh, a LEO antenna, as a repetition or backup through microwaves or fiber. These sites could be taken as a repetition site and then to continue with the connectivity with the cluster. It could also be a virtual trunk if this were the only option. So then you have high capacity on this location. Then for smaller sites, these are the ones that we are using. This is a flat panel antenna. It has to have full visibility to the sky. So compared to the others where they have to be at an angle for a smaller site, when you put a flat panel at the top of the tower, that's a perfect place. And finally, you have the cellular on wheels. These are mobile platforms that have an antenna at the top of the truck. And then you can deploy a mobile radio base in the event of an emergency. So having said that, I now finished my presentation. I think I did well with time. The timing, if you have any questions or comments, I will be happy to take these. And otherwise, you have my contact information. 
Uh, you have Gustavo Mercado from the Space Agency in Argentina. I'm a member of ISOC and uh, I can. Congratulations, very clear. It's not so common to have orbit topology presentations and meetings such as these. And as I said, this has been most instructive. I share your opinion that this type of new technology and these companies that have come up in recent times, we had managed to achieve global coverage to provide connectivity from one pole to the other. And of course, this is very useful to provide connectivity to those areas where there is no connectivity. For example, fiber optics, mobile phone access, mountains, deserts, and in rural areas. So my question goes along the following lines. The large, uh, n largest number of users and businesses in terms of the internet business are located in the cities along the roads with a greater deployment of mobile telephony and fiber optics. So how will your company or how does your company have a strategy to compete in the cities with your spatial technology? Sí, claro. Digamos que... Yes. Satellite technology has the aim of providing connectivity in those places where nothing else is available. So our focus in order to not to compete is to supplement satellite stations of the type GEO or OneWeb in the case of emergencies, like I showed in the slides, you kind of a backup system or repetition system. So the idea, as I said, was that, uh, for example, uh, after September 11, we saw that all terrestrial problems were blocked. So we have seen interruptions in the fiber optic wires and some cases where the connection was interrupted. So this allows us to have satellite backup in order to maintain basic communications priorities like voice communications, video communications. So the satellite part would be a backup supplement in those areas where terrestrial networks are already established. Thank you. I'm Douglas from Brazil. That was a great presentation. I'd also like to thank the LACNIC organizers for bringing such an interesting topic. My question is similar to what he commented, but you referred to the multi-orbit scenario to the land devices. This also takes me to issues not only regarding multi-satellite orbit, but also multiple combinations, satellite with fiber, with mobile telephones. That is something that I'd like to ask you how you solve that. What are the protocols you use? It might be SDN1. What is the backbone for routing based on the latent loss in latency, so what is the technical part behind all this? As Utilsat One Web, we are developing internally our own solutions, but this hasn't been fully developed. Right now, we have based ourselves in the distribution panels that offer the final solution to customers. Now, one of the advantages and so the enterprise uh, solutions is to use a terminal that has already been developed. It is at the testing stage and about to be released. These are multi-orbit terminals. So right now we have terminals that are already active that can have two types of satellite connectivity plus LTE connectivity, but only LEO satellite. If you want to have a geo, I have to put another antenna and then SD-1 to do load balancing, and also depending on 
the type of parameters you include, for example, latency, availability, better signal, and so on. So it takes the route that is the one that is most appropriate. Or also, in the case of the two orbits being OK, then load balancing and increasing the capacity. But the GeoLeo terminal is also in the process of being developed, the two are KU band, so they will provide LEO and GEO connectivity in one single alternative uh, antenna sorry, with the option of LTE. In the case of fiber, well, th this will have to integrate the one systems to provide interconnection with all the technologies in one same client so that the best route can be selected. and do the corresponding load balancing. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I will be around, and we can uh, discuss this. Thank you, Alejandro. So we apologize because we are a bit behind now. I anticipate that we will go beyond 1P.